many kids do we even have in here today? <laughs> oh, good, good. Because uh, I was gonna do, I didn't really think too much about what children's story I was gonna do this week, so I just thought, I still have some things from last week's children's story that I kinda wanted to give out. I don't know how many of you guys saw that, but I have some gifts here. Some kazoos. How many of you guys have heard of what a kazoo is? Because the kids over there were like, what is a kazoo? <laughs> Never even heard of a kazoo before, which is sad. <laughs> Makes me feel old. Avon's probably gotten like three of these now. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And for all you parents out there, I'm sorry. Um, and if, <laughs> if you get tired of them, maybe they'll just go missing. <laughs> so do you, I don't know how many of you are wondering why are you usually giving out kazoos today. That's weird. But it's, it's to kind of go along with an interactive story from Joshua chapter 6. Um, do you guys need help opening those or maybe learning how to use them. Alicia, I'll give you one. Because I know you know how to use one. I don't even know if these have all the right parts in them, honestly. Because last time they were having a hard time using them. Yeah, you have to hum a little bit. So, Joshua chapter 6. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. But then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. And here's where it gets kind of interactive. How many of you would be interested in maybe just marching around this pulpit right here? Um, march around the city, huh? So the pulpit is Jericho. Yes. It's all just a visual aid, really. Like, it, it doesn't mean much. <laughs> March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Now, I'm not going to make you do it for six days. <laughs> Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Then when you hear them sound a long blast of the, on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up straight in. Now, give a loud blast. Nice. <laughs> nice. No, I'm not going to I'm not going to yell into my mic cuz now I see how after listening to the one last week I see how um that can go with headphones on. So everybody else kind of do your thing. Give a loud shout. No, a loud shout. <laughs> a shout. <laughs> now of course we don't want these walls to come down because that would be a problem. God doesn't want that. But this is all kind of a visual aid to show. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, someone sent me a, a reference as to how thick the walls were. And there were actually two layers of walls. There was kind of a lower wall, then a hill, then an upper wall, which was so and so high. The lower wall was kind of smaller, but the upper wall was the real beast that kept the city protected. No, none of them thought that that wall would even be penetrable. Like They thought they were completely safe, but because these Israelites are marching around, doing weird stuff for six days, seven days, <laughs> then they blow some horns and then they yell these impenetrable walls just came down. But why? Was it because they just marched around? Or was it because they had faith in what God was instructing them to do that made these walls collapse? Now, hmm? oh, yeah, go ahead. God was them. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Okay, here you go. God was helping them. Yes. Good. I like the interaction from the kids, you know. 
Because it shows that they're learning something, that they're observing, right? That's how. Hmm? No, it's not a kill dozer. <laughs> that was, that was probably. Oh, do you know? <laughs> do you know about the kill dozer? I was, I was shocked that last week. This was awesome, and I still watch it to this day because it just makes me laugh every time. Uh, the kids in the Idaho Falls church, one of them probably like four or five years old, I don't know. You know, he, they were asking a lot of questions, and one of them was like, well, what if we built a killdozer? Would that take the walls down? I was like, it's not. As I'm, <laughs> as I'm walking over here, I'm like, wow. <laughs> I didn't know this kid knew about the killdozer. That's crazy. But I, I, um, after chuckling a little bit, I thought, it's not about the killdozer. It's not about the tools that they use. It's, it's the obedience. It's the faith that that they have in God's plan and not their own that brought the walls down. Then he asked me about a garden hose. He's like, what about a garden hose? And I'm like, what, are you going to spray the wall? Wet it, like get it a little wet before you use the kill dozer? No. <laughs> I'm sure that if the walls were still up today, you could launch a nuclear missile at that thing, and it wouldn't go down. It would just contaminate the area, really. Um, but... <laughs> It is not about what we think, because I, I was trying to get at the fact that like all those people that are probably walking around this wall are thinking, why are we doing this? This is weird. This makes no sense. Just like what I'm about to be doing in a couple weeks makes no sense, but <laughs> to me, it's, it's very odd to me that I would be uh, trying to do what I'm about to do in becoming a pastor. Because, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, I have to be obedient. I've been running from that calling, you could say, all my life. But after getting beat down by the world, I realized, okay, I think it's time to finally listen. <laughs> so fair warning to you kids, like if you feel a calling from God, first test it, of course, to see if it is from God. But also, just listen. <laughs> Because just like these Israelites listened and did what they were told, whether it made sense to them or not, it worked. It brought the walls down of a city that they didn't think was possible to conquer. So that's, that's kind of the message I was getting at today. Thank you. Good morning. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Interference. Okay. Huh? Oh, yeah, later on. Thank you. It's the clicker. <laughs> Why do we? Uh, so, my sermon title today is The Second Touch, and there are some questions that I kind of wrote down in the beginning. Why do we come to church each week? And do we need to come to church in order to have a relationship with Jesus and achieve salvation? Achieve salvation? Can we achieve salvation on our own? No. Why do we come to church each week? Um, is it something that we have to do uh, to have this relationship? Let's first establish what is church. Now, if you look it up in the dictionary, you might say, a building where Christians gather to worship. It's very... Um, yeah, that's what it says. But I would like to think of it as it's a community. It's a, it's a family. It's, um, it's a support group for people. If they're struggling with their lives, they have a family to, to go to for guidance and for prayer and for just 
company, frankly. Like, because some people, this is all they have. This, this group of Christians that meet in this building to worship God. That's all they have for their social life. That's all they have for their, for their guidance. Those two questions are probably asked a lot more than we think, both by believers and non-believers, Adventists and non-Adventists. I think about some of those, some of the more well-known beliefs that we as Adventists have that sets us apart from other Christians, such as the Sabbath and our health ministry and some of the many other ones that, that we have. Uh, some Bible verses about going to church include Hebrews 10.25, let us not give up meeting together, but encourage one another. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Matthew 18.20, and you know this, this one really hits home the most, where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So, we have a lot more than two or three people in here. So, therefore, the ho- we, we can all feel the Holy Spirit pouring into this room, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully it's not just my words coming out of my mouth and it just makes no sense, right? Now, we all know or should know that we do these things not for salvation purposes, because that would be a legalistic or works-based relationship or belief, and we don't want that. That was never the way to approach a true relationship with God. We should all know how we, we all should know to achieve righteousness on our own would be an impossibility. I think about this new walk with Christ that I'm on and how I can help people understand the way we need to approach the message of the gospel. A verse that I think about to counteract this idea of works-based faith is found in Ephesians 2. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepares in advance for us to do. That should tell us where the things where the things we do come from. That should explain why we follow the commandments of God. We wrote those, uh, he wrote those in stone to show us the blueprint of a happy, love-filled life, not to be a micromanager in the sky. He is a loving father, cr- leading his children to, on how to live a good life. I think about growing up in Utah as an Adventist, People, now, as soon as I say the word Utah, you already know it's coming. (laughs) People who are LDS either fully embrace their faith or totally reject it. I'm seeing this living in Utah. I'm seeing people who are LDS either fully embracing their faith or totally rejecting it without any second thought. Leaving God was as simple as abandoning a phase or a trend in their life not, by, not like losing the most important connection they could ever have. I also found myself not just looking at the LDS church in a condemning light, and you can put this into any sort of faith that is not our own, but for me, it was at the time, it was the LDS church. In a con- you could look at, I have also found myself not just looking at the LDS church in a condemning light, But as an Adventist, I especially looked at the Catholic Church also as the enemy. I'm sure other people, not just in our faith group, but throughout Christianity, can all agree that this tribalistic view is a bit unhealthy. Can we all kind of agree that we we can kind of see that sometimes in our own faith group? Is it not just me? I would find myself at times questioning my own faith. I wouldn't pay much attention to what was said in church so the stories didn't mean much other than repeated tales from the past. Eventually, this downward this downward spiral would happen 
but I can see now where that might have come from. It came from a slip into self-righteousness and judgment for the people in the area, for the people around me that didn't believe the same things that I believed. They try to control my life, so therefore I resent them and their beliefs. No matter how many mistakes I made in my life, at least I wasn't like them. I had that viewpoint, and it was, it was very dark, and it was only getting darker. This state of spiritual blindness reminds me of that verse in Proverbs 26. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Now, how many of us can say that we have been that dog returning to its vomit? <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand. Do you see, a, and the next verse really hits home, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Whoa. Shouldn't we be wise? Shouldn't we have wisdom and, and belief? Well, yes, but not wise to ourselves, not wise to our own beliefs and our own thoughts, our own works, our own actions, because that's just self-righteousness, right? I was the man wise in his own eyes who would later become the dog returning to its vomit, both at the same time, if that's even possible. It's almost like, you know, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm so smart. I'm <laughs> They're not like me, and I'm not like them. But <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> got a little graphic there, a little very descriptive. This pure state of delusion would thankfully be made right later in life, but through a lot of self-searching and a lot of <laughs> and leveling of the pride and the confession of shortcomings. I came to see how the people I was judging are just looking for the same truth and rest that I was and should be deserving of, to be treated with love, not judgment and condemnation. And unless you believe the same way I do, I don't like you. I don't want anything to do with you. My spiritual walk over the years can also be compared to what happens in Mark 8. Jesus heals a blind man at Bethsaida. Now, keep in mind, I, I was, I want to go back. At 12 years old, I was baptized into the church. But did I realize what I was getting myself into? So, you, okay, this story is going to make a lot more sense with that context. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Now the blind man looks up and he says, I, I see people. They look like trees or walking around. Okay, so I'm glad that you're seeing something, but <laughs> clearly you're not seeing everything that you should be seeing yet. Now, I could compare this to when I was first baptized into the church and, you know, I, I could see something, but... I had some kind of belief, but it wasn't quite as clear as it should have been. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. This story is why I decided to call this sermon today, The Second Touch. Now, I, I th we think about that story, and it's like, could Jesus have healed that man on the first touch? Absolutely. But he did that for a reason, to teach us something, I believe. Because there were other people that he healed on the first touch. So clearly he could have done it for this man too, but there was a message behind it. And I, I believe that that is what leads me to talk about this today. Another man who went through some similar experiences happens to be one of my favorite people from the Bible, because I can relate to him very well. The Apostle Paul, he could probably relate to that proverb about a dog returning to his own vomit and a wise man being wise in his own eyes and also went through some hard times just like me. In Acts 9, it says, Meanwhile, Paul was still breathing. Oh, 
Wait a minute. Is that it? Okay. Meanwhile, Paul is still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the, w the way, that's what they were called back then. They were called people of the way. They weren't called Christians yet. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem as he neared Damascus on his journey. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. I, I think he listened to that. <laughs> he had to, because he just got struck blind on the road to Damascus by something he couldn't see. He, he, might, have seen, he might have seen that like there were trees walking around. He didn't know what was going on, so he listened. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Okay, so he saw nothing. He didn't see trees. So they, so they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind but did not, see, uh, did not eat or drink anything. Luckily, his sight would later be restored, but only in doing so, he would be woken up to his hypocrisy and find himself condemning and judging instead of sharing the love of Jesus, which was what he should have been doing all along. But in all this happening, he would, be, he would become a very powerful messenger of the gospel. And I, I remember hearing a story that you know, when he first approached these people that he was persecuting, they were scared because <laughs> they heard about him. He was the dude who was coming to kill them or imprison them. So... But to see that transformation in him made them think, okay, I think what we're doing is still the way. <laughs> wow, powerful for bo on both sides. I think about how my own experience has led me to finally decide to follow that calling to ministry. I can try to reach people that may not have been in a position to hear the good news before, especially not from a guy like me someone who was very judgmental and condemning and it's my way or the highway, uh, making justifications for my own actions, but telling basically like, do as I say, not as I do kind of stuff. Because I'll, I'll be honest, um, in talking to people that are no longer in the church or were never in the church to begin with, uh, can any of you agree that have also talked to these people, have you heard a lot of, they're just hypocrites and liars. Am I wrong? They're just hypocrites and liars. Christians are hypocrites and liars. Well, I hate to say this, but, you know, people out in the world are also <laughs> hypocrites and liars. So it's just something that we are as human beings. So don't think that, like, you know, just the people who show up to church on a Saturday or a Sunday are the only hypocrites and liars out there. It's, you might be the hypocrite and liar even saying that. So I can try and reach people that may not have been in a position to hear the good news before. The people I used to judge and shun, I later became. The power of being able to relate to people's struggles is a very beautiful thing for me because, you know, I... I never thought I would become an alcoholic. But what, what did my judgmental, self-righteous attitude end up bringing me to? That. The uh, trying to drown out my sorrows kind of guy. <laughs> but now, after being, uh, being healed from that, I can find myself being able to relate to people in those same circumstances that I was in. People that may have been shunned by the world, shunned by maybe people who are supposed to be preaching the gospel. And I, I'm not trying to point out any fingers to anyone, whether they're watching this or 
or here. I'm just trying to throw, something, throw some ideas out there because that's what we do in a church, right? This church should not be necessarily, an, I'm going to use the word echo chamber. <laughs> it should not just be like a bunch of people agreeing with everything. Part of the beauty of a church is that everybody has a different viewpoint, a different relationship with God. Because if you look at the four Gospels, were they all written exactly the same? No. There were stories in there where there were two men instead of one, or this or that. There were slight differences because everybody who wrote them saw things from a different perspective. So um, I, I think that shows that we don't always have to see things the same way, but we should all agree that we are pursuing the same relationship with Christ. Am I wrong? Another one of my favorite verses from the Apostle Paul that talks about what happens to us when we have that true saving grace experience is found in Galatians 2, verse 20. And I, I love this verse because, again, I can relate to it in my ex own experiences. Galatians 2, 20, For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I, oh, I, and this is, this is a very powerful one. Galatians 2, 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And what, what, what can that mean to those people who think, I don't need church. I don't need a group of people or a gathering of people to have that relationship with Christ. These people that, that think that they don't need all that, that they don't need this community, uh, I can see them kind of thinking, well, I can follow the law on my own. And, you know, this is... Uh, or th those people that, that just reject religion in general. I, I think about the people that are outside who think, well, I can just be a good person on my own. I, I, I follow these morals even though I don't know where they come from. <laughs> They're just there. It's just how we do things. Like We, we do things by a, a majority vote. I've heard that before. Like Our morals are based on a majority vote. Is, does that seem a bit dangerous? Because... <laughs> There are countries out there where the majority vote says cannibalism. Well, <laughs> so is that how we're going to base our lives? Are we going to base our lives so on a, a group of morals or commandments that are placed in our heart, that are written in our hearts? Some people, I've, I've seen this, they, they take credit for these good fruits that they are producing in their lives, but they take credit for them instead of Christ doing the work in them. Because, you know, in, in talking to some of these people that left the church, like, I don't need the church to be able to show love to my neighbor. Okay, okay, I see where you're going with that, but who do you think, like, I see the fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. But where are these fruits coming from? <laughs> are they ours, or is it from Christ who lives in us? What is true faith? Some similar words could be reliance, conviction, optimism. But I would also like to include the word love. The word faith and love, can, I, I see that those two words kind of going together. Because uh, I think it was last week in a Sabbath school up in Idaho Falls, we were talking about marriage and divorce. Um, and why, like I say the word divorce because sometimes marriages fail, like mine. <laughs> I did not have true faith, true love in that marriage because at the time I didn't know what that meant. Just like I didn't know what the word faith meant at, at a time. There was a time where I did not understand, and a lot of people still struggle with what is true faith. Is it something that we can just manifest on our own, or is it something that is given to us? Just like conviction, conviction, what? Wow, I could go into that, but. <laughs> um, 
in this next week, oh, wait, I don't want to go there. So let's talk about faith a little more because <laughs> we got a lot of time. <laughs> um, when we, we think about those words, reliance, let me go back, reliance on our partner, um, conviction in this relationship that we have, optimism, opti hope for the future. Those could all be synonyms for the word faith. But just like we have faith and love and hope and reliance on our partners, how much more of that should we have in the God who gave all of this to us? In this next week, I would like to find those verses about faith and replace that word with love just to kind of hear how it sounds in a different way and maybe shine some more light on it. People need to be taught about what faith is in a world where too many people are giving up on God. We need to show them the fruits that is true living faith that, oh, sorry, that true living faith can bear. In Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, I would like to look at that verse a little differently and say, who have the love of Jesus? Because in another, in another sermon that I did, I replaced the, word God, the name God with love. Here is the patience of the saints. The patience, hmm. Here are those who keep the commandments of love and the love of Jesus. Oh, okay, I'm not going to do that. Here, who keep the commandments of God, and let's replace faith with love of Jesus. And that also goes both ways. The, the love of Jesus towards us and the love of Jesus from us, because it can go both ways. Um, when did we start this? <laughs> Honestly, it looks looks a little early. I'm doing all right? Okay. Um, in closing, I would like to include a section from Ephesians 4, unity and maturity in the body of Christ. So, yeah. Ephesians 4. Paul's appeal for unity and maturity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord... Then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, we took, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. He took many captives. Hmm. I mean, I, <laughs> what, what does that mean when it says he, he took many captives exactly? I, hmm. I didn't really look too much into that, to be honest. What, what does that say to some of you? Kind of an open question here. He took many cat. Like, what does that verse mean to some of you? I'm curious. Captive audience. Captive audience. Okay. Because I, I think of how some of these people out here might read some of these things, and they might take them a, a, a certain way, and it might harden their hearts a little bit unfortunately, because a lot of people like to say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. God is a narcissist. All these horrible things because they, they may not just, they just don't understand what it's truly trying to say. Okay. Continued. <laughs> what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers 
to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So, yeah, um, I just think about the, uh, just kind of the, the criticisms that I have for other faith groups and the criticisms that they have for, for ours. I hear a lot of works. That seems to be the biggest thing that they use to condemn and that we might use to condemn other people in their faith groups is works. Who's doing the works? Is it you? Is it God? Now let's, let's clear the slate here. Let's get rid of the whole works thing and just get to the center of it all. If, if we are to, like, as Adventists, if we are to have our beliefs, let them be based in love. Why do we follow the Sabbath? love. Why do we follow any of the commandments? What are the commandments for? Like I, like I said before, is it just micromanaging or is it to be, to have a life based on love, to reflect God's love for us? Um, I think about the, the two, like when they asked Jesus, what are the, the greatest commandments? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That, those are the greatest commandments because that is what the commandments, the first four and the last six were based around. How to have a relationship with God and how to reflect that relationship with God to our neighbors. Um, I think about Ephesians 10, or 2 verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, but it is not us doing the works. It is him doing the works in us. A, a verse that I really like to use a lot in my own life when I kind of, when I feel the spirit kind of calling me out <laughs> is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good works for his good pleasure, for whatever translation you're using. <laughs> that is, I, and I hear that a lot in my own mind almost when I'm, it's almost like I'm starting to get a little more self-righteous, a little more, uh, almost a little more confused maybe. Like, oh, am, I, am I doing things right? Am I headed in the right direction? I'm confused, and it's getting me a little anxious right now. I'm, I'm starting to feel a little fear, maybe a little trembling going on. And it's as if the Holy Spirit touches me, and he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is I who works in you. So he's got this. Let us all continue to invite each other to join in this fellowship of the Spirit where we can all help each other heal from the wounds of life or celebrate the victories because that is what church should be all about. We're, you know, we, we should be coming to these doors and leaving all of our troubles from the week at the door, checking our filthy rags in at the door and just coming in for some healing. We should not be bringing our drama into the church and then leaving the church with more drama. Because what, what are we doing to these people that are coming here just for some peace and some rest? We're showing them this is what we're all about. What, what kind of fruits are we trying to bear? Bitter fruits or good fruits? So, and keep in mind, this is not me like trying to... <laughs> 
uh, call anybody out, whether they're on the screen or here in person, so keep that in mind. I, I just, I'm just trying to address some things that we might see in our Christian walk. And I am not perfect, and if, anyone ha like, if anyone's going to call me out for being a hypocrite, I'll be the first one to step up and agree. <laughs> uh, let us also never forget our brothers and sisters in Christ that cannot be with us today because I, I do th think about those people that can't be with us today. And there are a few, especially around this time, you know. We have the fair going on, so people can't make it. We, there are fires out there. God bless you, Steve, for what you do. But there are also people for health reasons that, that cannot be here. And let us pray for those people. Let us reach out to those people. And I'll, like I said, I'll be the first one to do it. Because they, they also, there are people out there who desire to come to church, but they just can't. So let us also never forget our brothers and sisters in Christ that cannot be with us today. And I... I would also like to address the fact that in a few weeks, I, I actually put in my two weeks notice at work yesterday. That was a very special moment for me. I've been there for two weeks working at Sputnik. I've been there for two weeks and, or not two weeks, two years, <laughs> two long years. And I wrote them this letter to basically show them my gratefulness for all the patience that they had for me. Shout out to all my friends at Sputnik who are probably watching this right now. And I, in this letter, I, I just address with them, like, you guys don't even realize some of the dark moments that I went through while working here. Not from work, but outside of work. And I, I would like to show my appreciation for your patience with me. For letting me have a steady job because I can't think of all the times that I've ever had a job before and I was just being tossed to and fro, job to job, not having anything solid to stand on. And so I thanked them for allowing me to make mistakes and sometimes not even show up to work at all. Because of the, some of the dark moments I was going through, I just didn't have the mental capacity to even be there. I was going through withdrawals. I was going through anxiety, fear, trembling, trying to work out my own salvation. <laughs> but they, they stuck with me. And in this letter, I, I showed them my deepest appreciation for that. And I also left them with, uh, I can pull it up. I left, I said, I, I told them my plans, what I'm trying to do as a career, and some of them have already known this for a while, and like I said, they, they watched this pretty faithfully. <clears throat> I, I left them with Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, and not only was, was my work community faithful to me, but especially this church family. Um, I think about when I first moved here uh, back in August, or July of 22. I was a mess. <laughs> I was a broken mess. I had just come out of living in my car, drinking all the, all the pieces, and I just needed some solid ground to stand on. And I remember coming to this church in my filthy rags <laughs> and just feeling so welcomed here. I, I don't think I had been to this church before, before that. So this, that was my, one of my first experiences in being here was me showing up as that broken dude who, was, who just needed some stability in his life and wanted to try and rebuild that faith, have that second touch experience to see the truth behind Christ and have that relationship because I desperately needed it. 
I really did. And I want to thank you all for allowing me to go through some of my, my woes, <laughs> but still try and keep the consistency of going to church. Not because someone led me to. Not, I mean, at first it was my sister who uh, made me put on those filthy rags. And just get, get myself out of bed. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. And just go to church. Develop this relationship. Get to know these people. Get outside. Touch grass. <laughs> we, we all kind of need that sometimes. And I, I thank you all for, I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to go through some of these things and have this transformation that I had. I cannot tell you how weird it is <laughs> to even be standing up here so confidently and be doing this. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was getting to that. <laughs> through, only through Christ, not, not through you guys. Yes, let's, let's not get that mistaken. This experience that I had with Christ, I, I believe that I said this to, in, in my second sermon ever, uh, it was as if the, the scales had been taken off and I was able to see again and see Christ's love in this basement of a church, in this meeting that I was in, I saw the words faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And that, that makes a lot of sense now because that is what faith is to me, that is what hope is to me. It all has to, it all boils down to love. That is the center of it all. And that is why I am choosing to pursue this career in ministry is it should all be based around love. And I, I want to thank the people who put their hope and faith in donating to this cause. I mean, that's very humbling for me. The fact that people would trust their, their dollars that are, I know are hard-earned to... Now, I, I know that they're not putting it in me because why would you want to give, give money to me? But they, they, they felt that calling to uh, donate to this cause of me going to school. And it's, I just want to thank whoever has given to that. Whether, whether they're here or not I, um, I'm not, I don't even know who it was. But thank you. I know that the Holy Spirit was working in those people to do that because, again, they're not donating to me. They're donating to further the, the call to ministry in anyone that is willing to answer that call. But, you know, I would also like to address the fact that we all have our own special callings. You know, I'm, I'm not special. I never thought I was. We all have our, our duties as a church. Our, you know, some people are called to security. So thank you, Raina. We all have our spiritual gifts. Um, Ryan, I would like to thank Ryan. <laughs> Where would I be without you, Ryan? <laughs> because uh, I, I like to think about everything that goes into putting this all together. That is a church family. We have people who, I, I think about this, people who print the bulletins and fold them and who play the, the instruments. We all have our spiritual gifts. So... I, I thank God that we all are able to gather here every week to fulfill those those gifts and express them because you know that just shows that like God can take a lot of imperfect people, bring them together and show his good fruits in them. So now I'm kind of rambling, I know, but <laughs> Again, I, I would just like to thank everybody for allowing me to speak up here, even though sometimes it, it might not sound the greatest. But just allowing me to get that practice and also for um, your patience and your time and your love. <laughs> for expressing the love of Jesus through, through your words. And I will say this, that there are people out there who see this church and they, they love it. They think if this is what Adventism is, I want it. So keep, let's keep it up. <laughs> and I, I, I will testify myself that 
again, this was the church that I came back to when I first needed that transformation in my life. So I would encourage all of us to continue this walk with Jesus, and thank you all. May God bless you. Thank you for uh, this day, and thank you for taking a, an imperfect person like me and letting your perfect message flow through me. I, I want to thank you for uh, everything you've done for all of us. And I ask that you will please shower us with your Holy Spirit throughout the day and throughout the week. I pray this in your holy name, amen.